So this bill is actually quite broad. They mm -hmm. fought a long time over it, mm -hmm. and so there are a lot of compromises. But it mm -hmm. also leaves a lot of details to be worked out later down the mm -hmm. road, which mm -hmm. seems to me that there are a number of hurdles and possible pitfalls that will happen going down the there's road. A lot they, there's a lot they really couldn't do up front because it's extraordinary. First of all, it's, it's very complex. But if, if you're going to ask me, is this a, a, a good start at regulation? Incidentally, after every financial crisis, you get a lot of regulation. You had that in the 30s, and we're having it again now. And it's designed primarily to, to prevent the things that caused that crisis from happening again. And this, in my judgment, if it's designed to do that, is a great start in that direction. There are a lot of things that happened, things that were created by the banking system, by brokerage firms or investment banks that are now the same as banks, mm -hmm. uh, that were created by the rating agencies, uh, that, that were caused to consumers because of some of the egregious things that banks did. A lot of those practices which, which created the financial crisis, we've got a real start at preventing those precise things from happening again. So from that point of view, I'd say this is as we call it, landmark, and I would say positive. Okay, but, but there's a lot of a lot of details. Isn't there also a problem that's sort of like water moving around a rock? I mean, <laughs> if you say after the last crisis in the 30s, you saw a lot of regulation specifically designed to address that problem in mm -hmm. the 30s. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have a regulation that specifically is designed to address things that really angered, particularly voters, heading into the midterms: the mortgage crisis, the, wall, the, the what led to banks that were too big to fail and needed to be bailed out, etc. So now we're going to deal with that, and then the next thing that'll happen is that the water of the financial market will move uh, around the rock to the next crisis. It's called financial innovation. You'll see that all the That's time a on Wall Street. positive way to say it. Financial innovation, the ability of Wall Street to find its way around regulations to make a lot of money. Um, that's not going to happen probably for, as history tells us, for another five to ten years, but it's definitely going to happen. They're going to find ways uh, to make a lot of money in ways that are excessive and will create another crisis. Ten years is probably too soon. Now it's probably even going to be 20 years, but you have another crisis coming. But I think as far as preventing some of the sort of components of this crisis and lots of other crises, such as banks going far out on a limb to grease the wheels of speculation, to provide the money so that, um, so that we could do a lot of mortgage lending, a lot of mortgage lending to those that uh, really couldn't afford a mortgage. Right. Uh, all of that was created or made possible by Wall Street, and a lot of the things that they did to do that are going to be reined in on. So the banks aren't going to be able to provide the leverage that created the speculative excess, the crisis, uh, not to the extent that they uh, they did in 2004, 2005. Okay, let's talk about what it means, because as you noticed, it, it noted earlier, it's quite complex. Yes. What does it mean for the average viewer sitting at home? What will happen to them? I mean, the president says, well, you know, your credit card is going to be much better for you, and, you know, your mortgage, that's going to be better for you, too. We're going to put in a lot of protections, and it's going to be great. You're, you're going to love it. <laughs> like, a lot what of are this, they going to feel? Yeah, a lot of this is about Wall Street, and that is, quite frankly, not something that you're going to see. Uh, you're going to see a direct impact on if you're sitting in your living room, or for that matter, if you're doing anything. Uh, the, the truth is, though, there is a part of this, which is consumer protection, and the president is absolutely right. There are some things that are just not practices, shall we say, that they're not going to occur again, or at least they're not going to occur to the extent so that uh, we're going to have a regulatory agency that's going to overlook, that's going to be there for the purpose of protecting consumers. And so when you have credit card fees that are outrageously high or inappropriate, something can be done about it. When you have a mortgage that's given or extended to someone uh, who shouldn't have that mortgage or it has details in that mortgage, such as a balloon payment or an increase in interest rates that was not expected, there's got to be much more disclosure of that. So from the point of view of somebody asking, how's this going to affect me? Well, let's say the, the things get cleaned up a little bit. And so I'm not saying you're not going to have some outrageous things happen to you in the future. You will. But the point is, you're scaring is that me some, of the, okay. some of the things, well, of course, it should be everybody, obviously, you know, the old expression, buyer beware. And in this case, in all cases, that should apply. But uh, some of the practices that led to the speculative excess and obviously the crisis, um, we won't see those again. But will this unfair, I mean, part of, there were two, twofold. First of all, derivative, the derivatives market, mm -hmm. that's part of what we're talking about here, yes. regulation of derivatives, which I think I only have the 
the tiniest of grasps on. I mean, I get it, right? But And I think most people don't. And that's part of the problem. The more complex, the easier it is for the street to actually man manipulate the system. Oh, yes. But also, the issue of lending money. I mean, part of the problem was that there were there was all this money that was pumped into the system through TARP, through mm -hmm. bailouts, mm -hmm. but yet there was no lending coming out the other end. So will this help that issue as sure. well? Sure. Uh, it, it helps it because, you know, what it used to be, and this gets really complex, is the banks could make these loans, uh, mortgage loans, and then what they could do is package the loans and send, send them, them off to some hedge fund somewhere. The hedge fund would then own the risk, and the bank had nothing in the game, and the bank could go on and find another package of loans to make. And this, this created an enormous amount of lending to finance this enormous amount of speculation. Well, they can't do that anymore. First of all, the banks cannot form hedge funds to the extent that they used to, and they also have to keep some skin in the game, which was that simply means this. They can't offload all those mortgages anymore. They have to still own some of those mortgages, which means they still can lend. They can still provide leverage. They can still provide probably enough leverage to create a speculative boom, but it's not going to be as easy as it once was. So it's getting going to be much tougher on banks. I'm not saying they can't do it, but I'm saying it's going to be tougher on What's banks. What's not in here, in your opinion, that had to get cut out and left by the wayside because it was too controversial, it was too difficult for them to get there? I mean, this passed only for the grace yeah. of three Republican votes. The, there's one thing that everybody will tell you was left out, but I don't think it was entirely left out, was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Right. One of the big problems in, involved in the whole crisis. It provided all that leverage. Well, it isn't entirely left out because they're going to study it and then, then, it, uh, then get back to the issue of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is a real problem, and they're going to do that in the early part of 2011. So I would say that's the, that's the number one feature. I'd say the other thing is that, look, I think this is a start. There are a lot of things that, um, that banks and uh, investment banks uh, could do, and quite frankly, they still can do them. But there's just a little bit less that they can do. In other words, we've had a, we have a good start in reining in on some of those practices which led to this incredible speculative excess and the financial crisis that invariably follows. Well, part of the study thing, though, is the way that you kick the can down the road. It's like, a per, it's like sort of a time-honored mm. political tradition that you say, this is really difficult. We'll study it and get back to you. And we'll get back to you as soon as the elections are over. As soon as those 2010 midterms are over, we'll be getting right back to you about Ti that. Timing is everything <laughs> in the political process. And I think that their timing is going to be right on. There are a lot of things that have been sort of put off. And there's no question that I think when you started, you said the right thing. And that was that you said, look, a lot of this is going to be up to the regulators. We're going to have to kind of make this up as we go along. Well, financial market history tells you that that's kind of the way this works, is that you kind of set up the broad framework of, of regulation, of, of attempts to stop these practices. But the real details are going to have hammered out over time by the specific regulators, which means something very important. Is, is that it's probably not the regulatory structure that they've set up, which was an, is enormously complex, but it'll be the, really the regulators themselves that make this work or not. In other words, you have to have bright enough people that understand when there's a problem and have the guts to do something but about it in is, the face of political pressure. That's the devil's in the details. I mean, it, what enabled Elliot Spitzer to rise before the governor problem, et cetera, sure. when he was attorney general in the white night of Wall Street was the failure of the SEC he said, to actually be a, a strong financial regulator and then his, his, his use of the Martin Act to go after the street. I mean, that, it, had the SEC been there, had there been really strong financial regulation, that would not have enabled him to be able to take the bull by the horns and do that. No, that's, that's absolutely right. But to a great extent that, you know, a lot of it will depend on, on whether the regulators do pick up the ball and run with it. And I think to a great extent, it's got to be a realistic process. You know, you can't, I think everybody's learned something in this whole process. They've learned something that, look, you can, you can do the sort of hard-hearted regulation of Wall Street to stop practices, to really rein in on Wall Street and all the excesses. But if you start to shut down Wall Street, you can do probably more damage than you mm. can that's good. In other words, it has to be a balance. And I think what they're really simply saying is, look, 
Uh, we don't know what that balance should be right now, so let's turn it over to some smart regulators, regulators from the FDIC, SEC, Federal Reserve, primarily the Federal Reserve, and have them work out those details, because this is really tough stuff. Well, now what we'll see is the political fallout, of course, oh, because yes. we've seen a lot of jockeying around the governor of New York. Of course, Wall Street is here. It is the financial yes. economic engine that drives this state, for you better bet. or worse. You governor, you saw the mayor of New York City mm. weigh in. You saw some people in Congress, the senators, perhaps getting actually really a lot of people on Wall Street angry, donors angry at them for not stepping up to defend the street. So we'll see what the fallout is in the